Age of Wonders 4 has just launched, and getting into the game is a ton of fun across all the fantastical factions that you can both create or play. But if this is your first 4X, or even your first Age of Wonders, the mechanics can be a little daunting. In this video, I want to help break down your first campaign by going over all of the base mechanics, such as cities, the UI, sieges, diplomacy, claims, plenty of subjects. I'll assume you have got zero experience in the game, and while some of the things I talk about today are covered in the tutorial, I want to help give you a better context of those existing mechanics that are maybe not properly discussed or a little convoluted. You can quickly navigate to any subject mentioned or use them as a reference guide to come back by using the chapters in both the timeline and the description. Also, if you've not yet picked up the game, you can use my link to my Nexus store. Nexus gives you a Steam key directly from the developer, and it's a great way to support the channel as well as my mini Australian Shepherd's tyrannical toy addiction. Lastly, don't forget to follow me on Twitch, where I'll be streaming this game as well as the new CK3 DLC next week. Let's get started here on the Ultimate Beginner's Guide to Age of Wonders 4. Loading into the game, the first thing I want you to decide upon is how you want to approach being a beginner. This does say the initiation realm, it's a beginner scenario, but my opinion is don't choose it. Instead, choose a rise of the god or the story realm. The beginner scenario is really no different than choosing one of these set realms. It just has different realm modifiers and that it only has one harmonious land so honestly if you're starting off just go with rise of the god here it is a very short form series of missions that will allow you to ascend your first race and you'll have a nice like standard style of strategy tutorial missions that will push you through the game in a nice progression point this other one is going to take you maybe like 100 turns or so. These are like 30, 40 per mission. So you can get a nice good digestion of the mechanics as you push through stuff. Now, the way the tutorials work built into the game um, doesn't matter which one of these you choose. You're going to get the tutorial pop-ups regardless. You could even jump down to here, the Dead Realm, if you so wish. But still, go through the Story Realm first. One thing to note, though, with the Story Realm, when you do choose this... Um, go with easy difficulty the pacing of normal is quite difficult if you're brand new to this game and i'm just assuming you are so um the big thing though to focus on is that you can only choose a champion for this so if you are dead set on playing a wizard king then don't do the story realm but to be totally fair with you it's really not going to be that much of a difference between whether you choose champion or store or uh wizard king but like I said, these are all champions, whereas these other ones that are grayed out are all wizard kings. That's the first note I wanted to make before we actually jump into the game to talk more about certain mechanics. Um, and everything I'm going to talk about from this point on is actually using the beginner scenario because I don't want to spoil the story for you if you want to go through it. Loaded into our first match, let's take a look at some quick UI stuff just to kind of break things down for you if you didn't know about them. I think a lot of it is very self-explanatory, but I just want to kind of quickly go through it. Now, all these little blips here are pretty much all the menus you're going to navigate through in the game. And they can all be quickly accessed by pressing 1 through, I think it's like 7 over here. Let me see. Uh, this is 9. So Rally, Rally of Legions is 9. So 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way across. I will allow you to access all these little blips. So the first one here is Dipl Diplomatic Overview. This is basically going to show you every ruler that you encounter and free cities. Now this is going to be the, probably the tab you're going to use the most because as you expand across the map, you're going to understand, or no, I'm sorry, understand, you're going to encounter a lot of free cities and they're going to be all neatly organized in here. Otherwise you have to zoom all the way out, go to where that free city is, click them and all that action. It's just way easier to navigate through the diplomatic overview. And in my first like 10, 15, 20 hours of play, I didn't even realize this was there. So it's definitely pretty key to, to look at. Then you've got your quests here, which is really going to be your active victory conditions or any active quests that you get when you're doing the story mission or ones that free cities and other um, incorporated or integrated factions tell you to do, stuff like that. I don't find myself using this so, so much as far as like, okay, I'm going to choose my victory condition and then track it. And I'm, I'm done from that point of using the quest tab. The Hero Overview tab is pretty nice, especially if you're playing maybe Dark and you have people in your prison or your crypt and you want to reanimate them, whatever it is. It's worth noting here, though, in the Heroes tab, it's going to show you all of your heroes, anyone's in your prison or crypt that you can convert or resurrect as you progress your Mage Tower, which will show off in a little bit. But you also have Recruit, one of one. This is denoted by the number of cities you have. We have one city, so that's one of one. But I can actually recruit outside of that limit. What it's telling you here though is that your hero cap, which you see right here, is telling you that if you 
want to recruit people, it's now an extra gold cost to recruit them and it costs you a 30 gold upkeep. So you can recruit above your hero cap, it just costs you more and you have to deal with an additional 30 upkeep per hero above your cap. So worth noting. Now the magic materials is another really big portion of the game that you'll really be focusing on, especially dependent upon your victory condition. These will really kind of play hand in hand with the ones that you have in mind here because they're grouped into three sets. You've got ores, liquids, and plants. So ores have a collection effect. Basically think of it as a set bonus, right? You get Arcanium Ore, it's gonna reduce your, I'm sorry, uh, hurry recruitment for units is 25% cheaper. Focus Crystals is experience gain. And then this is unit cost less draft. But if I get all three of these, Boom, I get heroes gain defense, resistance, and bonus damage. That's quite nice. It really kind of pushes that uh, victory objective of military. Liquids here is going to be for magic because it's going to help out with my knowledge and mana gain as well as combat casting as well as um, uh, research spells cost 10% less knowledge. And then plants is going to help out with general diplomacy because it gives me Imperium for having all three. And then it's going to help out with migrating, absorbing, and founding cities, whispering stones, granting one or more legions, and then relationship with free cities and rulers. So it does kind of help you out with the diplomatic, um, or sorry, expansion victory, which allows you to occupy more provinces. So uh, your Magic materials too, you're gonna to get multiple as you go across the map, that doesn't give you increased bonuses. So for example here, if I have four of these Arcanium ores, it doesn't make it so that hurry recruitment is free or 100% cheaper. It just means that if you lose one of them, you're not gonna lose the actual collection effect. So I wanted to kind of make that distinction up front. You then have your cities thing that breaks down all the income, all any units, I'm sorry, any buildings or any units that are being produced Every little thing is shown right here in the city, and then you can simply click that too to go through to it. It's gonna be nice when you start to expand to three and four cities. I typically find though that my cities are quite close together, so it's quickly easy to na it's easy to navigate to each one of those quite quick, but this is, makes it a lot easier and, and, and neater to uh, jump to each one. And then your armies too, same exact thing. Also the nice thing too about this menu is that it shows you the movement left for that whole army because you're moving at the slowest speed so this army for example everyone's got 32 movement but if i were to put this scout it's got 40 movement into this army they're still going to move at 32. and um, it shows me the upkeep for this entire army so this whole army's upkeep is 40 gold a turn and this army's upkeep is six gold you put these two numbers together and you'll see it right here, unit upkeep is at 54 because it's both my armies put together. So that should give you an indication of, okay, where, where am I like um, hemorrhaging money upkeep wise? And you can kind of look at it through the armies tab. Now the Rally of the Legions, I'm going to cover in its own section because it's quite complex, but I did want to kind of quickly, quickly bring it up here. On the right side of the screen though, you do have some other UI things, your whole spell menu here, which has mana cost as well as your, oh, where is it? Where is it? this <laughs> your world map casting points so one important thing to notice with this game is that if this says i've got 30 out of 30 and summon zealot requires 60 it tells me that it's going to take this turn's combat casting plus the next turn's combat casting because i'm getting 30 combat casting per turn so those numbers here are the total amount of resource you need to invest into it then it tells you exactly how many turns it's going to take right the current turns 30 plus the next turns 30. But I've got enough mana to do this right now. You still just need that con that uh, combat casting. Now with your spells, depending upon if it's a summon spell, if it's a minor enchantment, if it's a major race transformation or a minor race transformation, it's gonna have an upkeep cost associated with it. So summon spells are unique in that if they summon a unit, it's a magic origin unit that will typically have a mana upkeep, not a gold upkeep. So it's kind of a way you can dodge gold upkeep, but you're still gonna have to maintain them, of course, with mana. And as you make these uh, unit enchantments and you um, do these major minor race transformations, they'll fill this active tab. Then tactical are any spells that you're gonna cast on the actual tactical or battle map, which you can see also has its own corresponding type of casting points called a combat, casting, uh, combat map casting point. 
because we don't have this on the current playthrough, I want to show it on another one really quick. Um, you can also queue up multiple spells and make them ready so that they're ready to go. So you would simply select one, it would go through its readying process, and then you can have it on the ready for the event that you needed. An example here would be Restore Undead, which I've readied for the actual event that I needed rather than me having to actually um, trigger this once I actually need it and having to wait through the process of readying it. So you can ready multiple spells and it's a very good idea, especially if you have a lot of buffs, a lot of heals, all sorts of cool things. And also too, this is what the active tab looks like when you have a ton of unit enchantments, minor race transformations, major race transformations, you'd find them all in this little tab right here. You also have the end turn button. This is an important one though. It's kind of like a little it's tucked away, but this is your alignment. And as you progress through alignment, either good or bad, you'll have events that will either be positive or negative. If you have a huge negative alignment, it's gonna say random events that occur have a, I think at max it's minus 25% chance to be negative. And you have a relation penalty for free cities and rulers that are neutral or better alignment. So keep those things in mind with your alignment there. And you'll get a nice bit of little enter notifications here. Uh, your event log, which is nice just to kind of know what's going on. And advice. So things that'll come up here are going to say something like, hey, you have low uh, gold production. Or hey, you know, you've got low uh, morale in this one city, whatever it is. You've got that little thing there. Now, one button that is just really not discussed at any point of the actual tutorial is this little guy right here, the economic overview. And it's pretty important. So we don't have a huge range to take a look at, but this is how you're really going to plan out and expand your realm. So when you look at this button or when you click that button, you're going to get all these little blips. And these little blips denote the the type of province you can create here. So take a look right there. We see build mine. Now this will allow me to expand into a mine. Now mines can only be present in locations that have iron, well, a resource node that is either an iron or a gold deposit. It doesn't need to be um, iron or gold, just one or the other. That will allow you to get the benefit of gold in this province in addition to the province's deposit, which is going to be gold for gold or uh, production for iron. And we're going to get into that in a little bit here. Quarry is going to help us out with, well, you guessed it, more production. And quarries do not need iron deposits. They can be built um, dependent upon the actual... Um, oh, God. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me go over it. Ah, oh, God. Well, let me hover over the quarry. I think I can hover over, if I go over right here. There we go. So quarries will allow you to be put on only specific uh, plots of land. Um, same thing here with farms and foresters. Both of these will also be required to be on specific plots of land. As you can see over here, this is just simply a fertile plain. So I can place a farm here. This is grassland and also has a forest on it. So I can now put uh, a forester on here, a quarry or a farm. And now because we also have the iron deposit, I can place a mine. So just to kind of show you that with these grassland provinces, you still have quite a bit. Oh, gold veins here. So now we can place a mine, but we don't have any forests. So we cannot place a forester, but we still can make a quarry and a farm. And you'll also see that there's a difference in size in some of these icons. So take a look at this mine, take a look at this photograph. This mine says 15 gold. You know what? Actually, let's look at the farm. Farm says five food here, right? But look at the farm over here. This also says five food, but it's not getting any benefit from the gold vein. So it's just giving us a flat five food. Whereas this one is going to give us the gold veins additional 10. So when you look at the size of these icons, you'll, you'll see too in some provinces, the icons will be different sizes. It looks like none of them are around here are that, that way. Um, and that's just denoting that that's the total amount of um, income that you're getting from that location. A smaller one is telling me that I'm not getting very much total income from here. Only five. Where this is giving me five food plus 10 gold. Or this one right here is massive, right? So I'm getting 15 food because of the pastures that are here. So it's important to kind of get a note for uh, at least an idea of what's around you because in the very beginning, you do want to focus a lot 
on food because food is what allows you to expand your population and thus expand your provinces, gobbling up more and more territory and also production, which allows you to make more buildings. But we're going to jump into buildings and, and all that kind of stuff in just a little bit here. But that's your general UI breakdown and it's pretty important. Um, there's some other little things that we want to take a look at too, like you have your affinity up here in the upper right hand corner, which you do just want to have a good mind for. And you also have this button that allows you to switch between the um, underworld and the overworld. You can also just simply press page up and page down. We do also have the empire development and the research stuff, which we're going to get into in its own section too. But that's your quick UI breakdown of what you see before you. So now that we've gone through the UI, let's talk really quickly about our cities. So your cities are going to be pretty crucial, right? You start with your first one, and it's also going to be the one that you need to worry about the most, because if you lose your first city and your hero, they, they both uh, are lost, then you lose the game. You can lose one or the other, but not both. So our cities, we've got two types of production, building production and unit production. So with our building production, you're going to be able to, just as you would imagine, build buildings. You're going to use this production stat, which is used to build city structures, to make buildings plus gold. So if I hover over, say, the library here, I can see this is going to give me knowledge. It's going to unlock the Arcane Institute, and it's going to require 130 production. Remember, everything in this game has got a cumulative score when it comes to producing things. So I need to make 130 production, which is going to take me six turns. Now, I can also boost stuff which means that I reduce its cost by 30% with the necessary provinces. That thing is like, there we go. It's like laser light show. I think I'm in Vegas right now. Oh, this is a Calvin Harris. So you build one Forester. That's going to reduce the cost of this by 30%. It's pretty substantial. So always be looking out for these boosts and how you can achieve them. Town Hall, for example, you need three population to unlock it. But you also need five population to boost it. So you might as well just wait and boost that bad boy. So when you click on Library... You'll see that it'll put it here into the queue and you can move it forward in the queue, pressing that button. Um, you don't lose any production that you've put into a building uh, unless you cancel it. So I have already invested production into this. If I, if you can see the little, uh, the blue bar here, if I cancel this, I will lose that production. And it's worth noting too, that I've clicked this library. Well, the next one, the next upgrade to the library is already available for me to build. So I can queue them up for as far as I can go until I reach some sort of roadblock here, right? Orgy summons into the tithe shrine, the vendor, all those things. Now, I don't recommend you have a huge queue, but I do definitely think a two or three building queue is quite nice because you're going to hit some sort of quest and such that'll say, hey, here's some production. And you do bank the production if you don't immediately use it, but otherwise it'll auto build buildings for you. So it's a nice way to just kind of get those buildings done with. If it banks the production, you could put it in a queue and it'll still auto build at the next turn. It's just nice to have it already done immediately. I think... Oh, the big thing too also is hurry production. So you can spend gold to have something immediately built. So you can see the storehouse, hurry production, it is now built. And the same thing applies here for our scout. We have the ability to outright build it or let it take its three turns. And with a scout, rather than using production, we're using draft. <laughs> Oops, draft. <laughs> and go ahead and press this button. And we've made our scout. So I, re um, I recommend you definitely have two scouts. Uh, I'm going to talk about manually moving the scout when we get to the army section, but definitely have two scouts in the beginning. So after you've built buildings or recruited anything, you have this produce merchandise and this generate food ability. So if you're not building anything or recruiting anything, 25% of your draft or 25% of your production gets converted into gold for buildings or food for units. So this allows you to get a little bit more out of any time you're not making a unit or producing buildings. Now, outside of this too, we have all of our income sources, your Imperium, your knowledge, which goes towards your to your tomes, your mana, which goes towards your units and spells, your gold, which goes poor, uh, towards both units and city structures, draft for units, production for city structures, and then food for population, strictly for population. Now, it's worth noting too that your food does have an upkeep. It's your population amount times three. So... When you, uh, you can see here population minus at one X minus three. Once we jump up to a second thing of population, we will then have to spend more food. Now you also have the ability to attract population. So you spend some Imperium and immediately get population just like you can for units and buildings. So I'm going to go ahead and press this button and I can now expand out my location. I definitely recommend that you choose a, um, 
a lot of farms in the beginning. Farms and quarries or any kind of production bonus. Um, I mean, a quarry for uh, if I had an iron deposit. There, there we go. Quarry if I had an iron deposit. Uh, mine if I had a gold vein. Just I like to stack up that bonus. But definitely look for any kind of farms and uh, production bonuses because essentially what that's going to do is increase your population quickly and allow you to make buildings faster. So it's a real big key to... Uh, to coming up in the world. You also get this really cool little guy right here, which is, it looks like just the name placard, right? But there's a lot of information here. This shows me any buildings. This shows me any units. This is my obvious, my fortification health. This is crown is because it's the crown city. And this too is the population number. So when you see cities around the map, they say like the Twinmont 11, it's not the 11th city, it's 11 population. One other thing to talk about, too, is your automation. Um, also, also there's, there's this, the city stability. Now, your city stability, if you're, neut if you're neutral, you're fine. But if you're low stability, you lose city income. And if you're high stability, you gain production, draft, and food income bonuses. So keep those things in mind as you move up. If you're dark, you don't ever worry about that. But you can also automate cities. So expansion focus deals with how the city... If I hover over this, okay, if I hover over this how the city expands its provinces. You can say balanced income, just have it move towards whatever, or you can choose a specific resource for it to focus on. If it cannot choose that thing, so for example, if I choose knowledge, well, there's no knowledge for it to expand into, but knowledge, knowledge is down here. So it'll choose a balanced income for choosing anything else, but then start moving towards where it can do knowledge, which would be down here in this sector. Uh, or I mean province. Also, you have the ability to automate production, in which case it'll just simply produce buildings for you. Now, you wouldn't use this in your first, maybe even your second city, but you'll definitely use it once your cities reach a certain size or you get just enough cities where you're like, I've got too many cities to micromanage per turn. You can assign a governor, which every single uh, hero, when they're placed as governor, gives income bonuses of varying types. And you can boost these bonuses according to their skills, their stats, any number of things. But this is those income bonuses right there. You also have the ability to give it a Whispering Stone. Now, Whispering Stones you can give to vassals, which will have its own section. But this is a nice way to boost city stability if it's pretty low for you. So you can give this to just kind of pepper that facility or uh, stability quite nicely. Provinces will reflect the same thing down here, right in here. And it's just all of your provinces listed that you've claimed for this city. Structures are all of your existing structures with the ability to break down or dismantle any of them as you see fit. And the last big note I want to talk about here for uh, cities is your city cap. Now, the base city cap is three. And once we talk about empire development, we'll go into this whole tree. But you can increase your uh, city cap with this right here. It's a repeatable general right. and It'll increase your city cap by one. Now, that's important because if you reach a city cap, you're fine. But if you go beyond it, exceeding your city cap results in minus 25% city income to all of your cities for each city above city cap. So you go above one, you're minus 25%. You go up above four, you are now minus 100%. So that is a quick breakdown here of your cities. And hopefully that gives you a good idea of how to approach them in the beginning. Definitely focusing on your farm and your quarry, but definitely don't neglect stuff like your knowledge income, which is your tome progression, your mana, which is your unit enchantments and such and so on and so forth, and also your Imperium. So when you start the game, you do your first round of arcane research. You'll be presented with three spells, research, skills, abilities, whatever they are, and you have to uh, research them. And you need certain amount of cycles of research to get to the next tome. What I mean by that is once you do four rounds, you see next tome, four research cycles, but basically once you research four spells, you'll be allowed to get the next tome. And you have the choice of selecting one of these or locking one. So I can lock, let's say, let's, let's lock Legion of Zeal because this is a unit enchantment, which I'll talk about in a second here. And then I can press shuffle. So I keep Legion of Steel because I spent 20 mana to do so. And we pressed Shuffle, which cost me an additional 20 mana. And we got two different spells to go. I look for, you know what? I really like Legion of Zeal. So Legion of Zeal, it says right here at the bottom, it's going to cost me 240 knowledge to do. And I'm getting 60 knowledge a turn. So that's going to be four turns. It's always going to show you the number right there. But just so you know how to do it, there it is. And in the upper left corner now, you see that that's going to take me four turns and it's going to kick off. Now, once you reach four cycles, you get to choose a new tome. 
and you can I'm gonna go to order because that's where you are right now um, we're Tome of Zeal now to progress up to tier 2 you need two of this of the previous tiers as you can see right here we're at one of two so we need it doesn't need to be order I can get a Tome of Zeal and I can go ahead and then grab the Tome of the Horde if I want it just any two previous tier tomes are required to progress to the next tier but it's important to see here that once you get to tier four come on let's go my little tool tip there we go tier four you need six affinity of the matching affinity for that tome so tomb uh I'm sorry tome of exhalation requires six affinity with order and then finally with um, tier 5 you need 8 affinity still the previous tome requirements are kick in and it is worth noting too only one tier 5 tome is allowed so do keep those things of no also when you're taking a look at your tomes you get some other little things that you want to take a look at contextually so you can see this is a summon spell you can see the kind of icon around it or the kind of little halo you can also see that you've got legion of zeal this is a unit enchantment so there are three types of buffs you can give more or less that's, that's a good word for it unit enchantment which is basically simply a buff to a specific style of unit it'll say affects unit type and it'll show you exactly which units it affects and which ones you have in your army so we're going to affect polearm units we've got two peasants in our army so wham wombo combo there you go but you also have uh minor race transformations if i can find one on here Keeper's Mark. That's a unit enchantment. But you have other, oh, ha ha, minor race transformations. So you can have as many minor race transformations as you want. But what's important here is you can shut them off. See, a race can have a number of minor race transformations at once. When you go to a major race transformation, you cannot shut it off. So these things still all require upkeeps, just like the unit enchantments do. do. You can see here affects both existing and newly created units increases the upkeep of affected units and can be canceled at any time by the caster um and uh, angel eyes here is a major race race transformation a, ra a race can have only one major race transformation at a time so keep those things in mind if you're looking at oh you know what i want to go really hard in the paint and order and then i want to pivot to shadow and i'm going to do angel eyes and whiteborn both are major race transformations mm, unfortunately you cannot do that so you have to really make sure you kind of at least just have a mind for it so you don't jump down a bunch of holes thinking that you're going to be able to benefit from all those things without knowing exactly what you're going to be able to pick up but on top of that too you know you, we talked about the unit enchantments but you also have right here a buff spell you can see that little icon around condemnation which is a damage and debuff spell and fanatical workers which is a city spell so the little halos around these are just a little bit different depending on i believe this is the one for something that you cast with um world map casting and these two are for combat map casting and looking at tome of faith this is what happens if you have a summon it's got that little halo around it so summons are what are called tome units you can find them in encyclopedia which is this button right here it'll show you all the tome units and again army heal is a friendly army spell that you cast on the world map take a look at that aura and look at that icon right there that's just it's just important to note those things because you might be getting army heal and going cool i'll be having a heal in combat unfortunately you will not you'll need this which is a combat spell which you'll be using in the actual uh combat map so just again looking at these if it's got the three little uh triangles you're going to use it on the world map if it's just got the two right there then you're going to use it on the combat map so kind of keep those little things in mind but when you look at every single tome you'll see this scroll on the right so every tome whenever you progressed into it it's going to give you two affinity of that tomes type you're going to get a special province improvement of that type which will give you some sort of way to break the game special province improvements essentially give you a a uh, province that you can convert so this for example circle of zealotry it's going to give me 10 draft per positive or negative level of alignment i get two city stability per adjacent province improvement so any other one of these special buildings and then unit deployment location meaning i can put units having them come out of here rather than the actual city but it also counts as a quarry so what that means is i can put this on a 
farm and convert that farm into a quarry. And why you'd want to do that is because there's other special province improvements that say stuff like, let's see if one of these says it in here. Uh, see here this says, oh, oh yeah, there is knowledge per adjacent farm. So if I had these special improvements where I'm like, you know what, I'm going to place this abbey down and I've got two pastures right here. So I'm going to get two farm bonuses. Oh, but I've got another special improvement that I can convert that province into a farm too. Cool. I'll put the abbey outside of it and I'm going to get three bonuses farms now from it. So this is how you break the game and make provinces fit a specific mold that you have in mind. But they, again, lastly too, you've got this little icon, which denotes a hero skill. Every single tome will grant you a hero skill, which usually matches something that the tome gives to your units. So condemn, target unit, enemy units become condemned until the end of battle. Um, whereas condemnation here is a spell, becomes condemned until the end of battle or Legion of Zeal, where they have zeal, which they do extra damage to condemned units. So it kind of fits the theme of the tome. Jumping here into Tome of Sanctuary, uh, this gives us Sanctify. So target-friendly units gain three bolstered and three bolstered resistance, which I think you then get from Salvation here. Uh, bolstered, Healing Spires, Anointed People, Status, and okay, so yeah, there you go. So this is Bolstered Resistance, which gives you resistance and bolstered defense. Whereas anointed people gives you status resistance and spirit resistance. So there's usually something in here that'll fit in with that ability, or it's at least in the same exact uh, pedigree. Might not be a one-to-one -one bonus, but you'll get something that's like, oh, okay, this is going to fall right in line. But it's just important to kind of get an idea for these. And you do not need to stay with the same affinity. You can sit there and go, okay, you know what? We're four into order, and I've gotten like a bunch of tomes here. I'm going to now switch over to chaos, or I'm going to switch over to hover over this. Let's see, well, opposite is chaos. So you can go into chaos without any issues in your own realm. The issue here with going with the conflicting affinity is that it says empires or free cities with opposing affinities will suffer relation penalties. So that's where it comes in choosing conflicting affinities. You can go as hard in the paint as you want in, into one direction of affinity, and it's not going to affect or hurt you in any way. But it will affect external circumstances against you when it comes to empires and free cities and you do want to make sure you push one affinity a little bit higher than the rest because those affinities are going to allow you to have special dialogue options and special options when you maybe explore ancient wonders or whatever it is and they won't even appear unless you have the bare minimum affinity so you won't even see if you're missing out on it so if you've just got three of every affinity then if you don't ever cross anything that has a three affinity requirement, you'll never see the special things that you could have access to. You always want to push one up because then it allows you to tap into more of the empire developments, which we'll talk about in a little bit here, as well as um, a faster growth through those trees. But those are your tome selections and how to go about them for the game. So we talked about buildings and tomes. Let's talk a little bit about your armies. So this is Army of Aldebrand here, my main character. And we have a lot of pretty good pertinent information. We've got my main character and we've got all my units within. And looking at the units, we can hover over their little icon here. The little This little bar is an experience bar. But if I hover over this, it tells me what their tier is. And the fact that their tier has certain upkeep requirements so base unit upkeep of 12 gold or 12 mana when summoned so keep this in mind because that upkeep amount is basically the tier times six so a tier four unit will be four times six to be 24 gold uh, versus a tier two unit will be six times two to be 12 gold so important to kind of note those things, keep them in your mind, in the back of your mind. But you also get a rank. So as you progress through your rank, you get additional bonuses. You can see 18 more experience. This guy will go from soldier to veteran, and he'll get six more health, and six more if he goes to elite plus uh, elite metal resistance, and then six more health if he goes to champion, then six more health, and then exalted resistance. So he gets even more resistance bonuses should he go all the way to legend. Now some units. Some units. I don't want to spoil everything here, but I'm just, what's gonna? There's krakens in the game, so I'm gonna show you krakens. Um, some units, like this one for example, will evolve. So champion level evolves kraken, and it just straight up turns into the kraken. So keep those things in mind. Really look at these things because some units are gonna have that, some are not. Most don't. Not all units evolve. In fact, I'd say. 
I don't even know how many units there are in the game, but I'd probably say maybe 5 or 10% evolve. So just look at it, though, to get an idea of what the progression looks like for your units. Now, what's really important here, too, is that you get a lot more context information of what this unit can do, or I'm sorry, what this army does on the battle map, especially as it pertains to uh -huh. combat. So I'm going to move my scout over here. Cool. And when you start off, I would manually move your scout around before auto-exploring. And I'll talk about that in a second. So, looking at my main army now. Army of Aldebrand. You see this little thing right there? That tells me the relative strength of my army. And what is used in the auto-resolves and or giving you an idea of what you can actually competently fight. So, this is 430. It's probably one of the most important stats in the screen. The game never tells you it's there. But if I click this guy, I see they're 85. So, I will be able to beat them Handedly. I mean, my scout, no, 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 my scout could never, could never hope to boot to win. But that's an important thing that you're going to use a lot as you push around the map to give you an idea of what's going to be easy for you to fight. And honestly, it's, it's, I've used it all the damn time. And it's going to add up to anyone that's in your order, your aura around you that's going to be assisting in the fight. So if I press this button, I can now have a red dotted line of what is around me that's going to assist in the fight. So if I moved, over here, and let's say that enemy was right next to us and I attacked, this scout would join in on the fight. And it's a very, very important button to get an idea of what's going to be joining in with you. Because you just add these two numbers, those two numbers together. So it'd be 430 plus this, and I'd be at 451. That's my total fighting potential. Then you have some other little buttons here. This one highlights all possible outpost founding locations. So you can quickly get an idea of where you can place outposts. So that's my first, losing my outpost locations that we can actually put things down. So some things will shut off the ability to make outposts. Having another outpost too close is one of those abilities. And you can only place outposts in locations that are one province away from your domain. Um, I'm sorry, from your claims. So I have an immediate claim on this, and I'm going to talk about that more in a second. But a distant claim on this, so worth noting. Also, you get... This ability, which is Forced March, uh, you unlock this through the uh, Empire Development, but the units gain 100% of their movement, but lose 30 of their current hit points. They also become exhausted for two turns. Forced March costs 60 mana at one, uh, in total. It's a pretty brutal thing, so you don't really want to use it unless you're moving pretty much within your own territory to get to another part of your territory quickly, because you're going to lose 30 health. You get the auto explore button, which is really going to be useful for your scouts. You just press this button and they're going to go and explore everywhere. They're going to prioritize picking up anything like this, just random little bits of stuff before exploring the top of the map and then going into the bottom of the map. You also have wait one turn and guard removes the army from the list of armies pending orders, which is really nice if you have an army just sitting here in one location and you're kind of waiting for stuff. You press this, it says orders required. Not anymore. So it's nice to just kind of be able to toggle that on and off for something that you maybe don't want to have uh, the move notification for. So a lot of great information from that little panel. Not very fully explained. You also have an idea of what their army morale is going to be. So anything that gave passive bonuses or maybe you encountered an event that gave them positive uh, morale, it's all represented right there. Um, and it's nice to just kind of see that you also can see the leader and what have you. Um, right clicking on them also brings up their unit card where you get all the information here at the beginning of the game This is not going to seem you're like ah, okay, whatever. It's a unit card But as you progress you're going to come across some really scary tier 4 and tier 5 units And you're going to want to know what they've got going for them before you jump into battle This is going to be all their little abilities all their little passive things But do make sure you look at stuff like this This is kind of more of the persistent things that are about the character This is a land moving character not a mounted character this character's not matched either. Um, but I can also see it's a support unit versus this character, which is a polearm unit. This character also has Evolve, will transform into a more powerful unit when it reaches the champion rank. As you can see, it'll go into a defender, which is my tier two shield unit. So just make sure you're looking at these things because they are very important and they will give you a lot of tips on how to fight something. And especially as you fight with more things that are having unit enchantments and all these other kind of transformations and all this kind of crazy stuff, it's important to look through this, especially before you jump into combat or even if you're in combat, look at it. Trust me, trust me, trust me. Your defense over here, which negates the amount of damage. Um, I think it was like something like 11 or 12% per defense number. One of these has got 
that's two, that's three. Okay, so yeah, nineteen percent up to twenty-seven. It's it's a it's a degrading um, scale, on a, uh, not economy of scale, but it goes down the more it goes up. You've got your resistance, which is your resistance to all non-physical types of damage, and you have status resistance, which is not present here, but it is right here. So status resistance is going to be resistance to specific status effects. Um, also, you'll see anything that'll give you negative resistances or positive resistances to other type of elemental status effects. So like stuff like burning or electrified, it'll all be on this little kind of like line right here. I don't think I have any. Yeah, this guy just has six um, status resistance, but those little things are important to give you context clues of what you're going to be able to resist. It's different than this, which is actual damage from that source. So if I get shot with something that does shock damage, I'm going to take 27% less damage. But if I don't have any shock resistance, I'll just get uh, shocked. I'll take perpetual damage from it or get paralyzed. Whatever shock does, I can't remember. Your movement here, which is how many um, movement points you have on the actual map, which we're going to talk about la uh, lastly here. And then our upkeep as well as our disband button. This is really, really hidden, but you can disband this unit so that you don't have to pay any upkeep on it. So last thing on your army here is movement. So as you kind of highlight here, Fertile Plains is six movement cost. But if I move on a road, there we go. Fertile Plains on road is five movement points. And those are your movement points. So pretty much it's just going to re reduce in that amount. But as you move into stuff like forest, it'd be seven, oh, eight for a forest. Or if you move into stuff like, uh, I don't think we have any. There's no deserts around, but mountains have 16. So you can traverse mountains and stuff like that, depending on, I mean, like there's a, there's a limit, right? Of course. Um, so keep those things all in mind. All these movement points are going to add up. You might be going, why, why does it take forever for you to move these locations? It's because of your movement points, uh, stuff like your, your, uh, scouts going to have a much higher native movement points and road walk, which allows them to kind of move on roads a little bit better. And you can make roads using the empire development tree, but that was your um, army army kind of breakout and give you an idea on that. Let's move to our next subject. I lied. Before we move to our next subject, one thing I do want to cover is regeneration. So as your units take damage, they will regenerate health per turn. You hover over this, it's going to tell you how much health you're regenerating. So we're regenerating five health because we are not in our own domain. If we're in our own domain, we're going to generate 25 health per turn. There's a number of factors that are going to increase this amount, but you definitely want to make sure you are maximizing your regen per turn so that you can keep yourself constantly moving because the more units you lose so most units will take casualties as their hit points drop so as you take damage your units will lose physical models in their formation which thus reduces the damage that they can do so keeping your health topped off maximizes the amount of units in the formation and maximizes the amount of damage you can do now into empire development we have this tree that has filled with basically talent points and you're going to gain affinity in these talent points every turn based off of the number of affinity you've got so in the upper right you can see i've got four one one plus four plus one plus one every turn i'm going to get one materium every turn i'm going to get four order and as you move down this bar you'll see like this one says turns available eight turns because it needs 40 total affinity You'll be able to progress through these and choose these. Some of them are one-time bonuses, and some of them are reoccurring. Take, for example, expand governance. Repeatable general right. Increase the city cap by one. Cost me 200 Imperium, and I'm going to get it in 12 turns. It's a really important one because it allows you to increase your city cap. Really, really good. But all of these will contribute to your general amount. So every turn, I get six because my total amount of affinities is six. Um, worth noting too, some of these are one-time cho choices, like this one. Instantly summons a bandit army under your control at your throne city. Just a one-time, one-go. Some of them too will say like, okay, here you go, gain the Crypt Blade, instantly gain. You can see the little icon is typically associated with a one-time a, a one -time buy, as it were. Uh, the rest are passives. So this will say like, or units recruited through Rally of the Lieges gain two rank upon recruitment. That's a constant passive that's always present for me. Or this one, call a Rally of the Legions event where you may recruit units at no cost. Gain, gain 10 recruitment points. A one-time ditty. So just kind of keep those things in mind. You'll be progressing through this, and it's why you want to really progress one a little bit further than the others so you can get advantage of all these goods as well, as fast as you can, and get access to any of the uh, special events that occur 
from those uh, affinities. So I moved over to another save here to show off the Rally of the Legions mechanic. And this is a really fun one, but I think the game doesn't properly explain it to you because it's actually pretty crucial, especially to some portions of the game. So this is a bunch of units, right? A whole list of them, and this has got a pretty wide spanning one. And they are, it's a list that is populated by any integrated faction, any faction that is a vassal of yours, and you can see those little icons right there. Um, and anything that you've gotten from quests or doing, uh, I thought this would show up, but the Sparkling Thicket right here and the Serpent Cavern, these are both Ancient Wonders. So they'll populate in this list. Um, and this allows you to summon these units for either yourself or your vassals. And we'll show that off in a second here. So you can see here at the top, you've got some stuff. Muster the Lieges, which is, allows you to reduce the time by... Uh, basically 50% towards the next rally. So this whole uh, set of units is populated every number of turns. And that those number of turns is called a rally. So I'll have the next rally in 15 turns. This whole list will repopulate and change. And I have got recruitment points. Now the recruitment points are, as you can see here, they're increased by every single vassal I've got, anytime I pick up an ancient wonder, anytime I integrate a society, that all goes towards it. So you see Dawnspire and Mistuary, they give me plus five. Well, those are both integrated societies. Kinslayer and Goldwall, well, they're just vassals, so they just give me two. So these points go towards this recruitment process. As you can see, there's a little point cost right there. And this isn't just a one-off. You don't just click one and go, okay, I recruit it. No, you can recruit pretty much uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. I mean, assuming I had the money for it, right? Um, I could recruit a whole army's worth of units, and I've got two options. And the options are broken out right here. It's kind of a weird little symbol. So this little guy right there, that little crown, that's your cost. That little symbol is your vassal cost. So I can spend 150 gold and four recruitment points to send this transmuter to myself. As you can see, recruit to Throne City. Uh, I said crown city, it's a throne city, whoops, 150 gold. Or reinforce it to a vassal for 76 gold. And the nice thing here is it only takes two turns. I can do a whole entire army here. I mean, I could, as long as I'm using all the points up, here, I can go all those units. You don't have to, you're not limited to just six. As long, you're limited by this recruitment points button. So, I mean, we could even go there. That's That's even, that's even more units. It'll take me... Still, only two turns to recruit what is essentially an army plus some. And this is a great way if you see, oh man, I've got a ton of enemies on my doorstep, and I just don't have any soldiers at my at my home base. Yeah, I'm going to pay a premium to get them there. 600 gold is, is quite steep, right? Um, but they're going to pop up, and I'm going to actually have defenders at my base. It's a really good late, mid, early game thing, whatever it is. Or maybe you've got a vassal that's really going to have a, a hard situation because they joined in a war with you and they're further away from your territory. Well, I can take this whole entire huge amount of army and I can send it to my vassal for half of what I would to be just to send it to myself. So Rally of the Lieges is a really under-discussed mechanic as far as the game's tutorials go, but it's super crucial to getting a ton of units in a pinch. I've switched gears here again over to my vampires. If you want to know how to build this race out, I've got a link for you in the upper right hand corner. You can build that faction if you want. But here is our discussion on vassals, whispering stones, all that kind of fun action. And vassals are pretty crucial to the game because in a lot of 4Xs, you just simply kind of snake up any single city you find. But in this game, it's actually pretty beneficial to have vassals. So let's take a look at Penway here. This is a, a city that I have got zero allegiance with. It's neutral. I basically just discovered them for all intents and purposes. And you start off right here as neutral. Now, of course, if they don't like you, maybe if, if you're evil or whatever, you will just jump into war immediately, uh, which I think happened with like this faction right there, Soul. But otherwise, you'd just be neutral. And what happens here is, by giving them a Whispering Stone, you will boost your um, allegiance with them per turn. And as you boost your allegiance, you go from neutral into your pact of cooperation. And this is what's gonna enable you to trade. And trade is actually very, very good here. And you can trade up to two resources are available. Magic materials can also be traded. And this is how you get magic materials in any location that's just not close to you. Or maybe it's just, you know, it's gonna be too far for you to expand or whatever the hell the situation is. That's how you can solidify magic materials from afar. Now, pact of cooperation will progress into a pact of loyalty. 
The Free City shares its vision. The Free City allows building on claimed provinces, which we'll talk about in a little bit when we talk about claims, and contributes two of its little trumpets to the rally of the lieges. We'll also reinforce and combat against marauders and rulers the Free City is at war with. So you basically get someone who's going to work uh, alongside you. And the last stage in this is your Pact of Vassalage. So all this works on this allegiance mount right here. And as you build your allegiance mount, you can see this is a min from 19 to 43, from 43 to 72, and then Pact of Vassalage, which is 72 to I think like 96. So we look over here at Gloom Hollow, which are, are these really cool necrotic goblins. And this allows us to become a vassal. Now, or I'm sorry, this is allows us to have a supreme vassalage. Now the vassals come in different tiers. You start with denying tributary, I'm sorry, well, you start with this one, minor tributary, all the way up to flourishing vassalage into supreme vassalage. <clears throat> and each step in this cog gives them, or gives you more of their income. So you see vassal income is 28, 22, and 20 at the very top end. This says the free city shares 50% of its income. We are currently in this stage of 40% of its income. And you have a bunch of ways to increase this through society traits and what have you. In addition, you also will see that this enables us to share all of its magical materials. So we no longer need to trade. They just give them to us. It contributes to the rally of lieges and then trading costs decrease by 20% and the city can be integrated. So I would press, oh, I guess I don't have that point yet. Um, I integrated this city. So you simply have a little button here that says integrate and you click it and they just become part of your empire like Murkwater was. Murkwater was its own standalone uh, faction. Uh, when you start the game, you'll always have a faction that is similar to yours, pretty close to you. I think the game just does that uh, natively, but I'm sure you can probably change that in the menus. You can also spend Imperium to boost your allegiance and it just depends on the amount left within that tier and you basically get the ability to just kind of push forward through a um, uh, a little node within the existing tier of uh, diplomacy you're working on. Let me go back to this. And then also trading costs is decreased by 20%. So I can click trade here, and this enables me to trade gold for maybe mana, or maybe give them mana for some production, or I can trade gold for a magic material. It's a really cool way to give yourself a little boost to a specific resource you need or whatever it is. And it's assumed to go back to your um, your crown city, your, your capital city, your throne city, <laughs> your throne city. I can't get the name confused a bunch of times but this is there it's a really really crucial thing and you really want to work on getting as many whispering stones into as many vassals as you can to solidify trade to solidify vision and to solidify possible future expansion points i mean if you take a look at where the gloom hollow is compared to my empire which is this big huge orange blob i can get a really nice expansion point to what is my ally over here and this guy over here the the cool thundercat um i can take this over, integrate it, and I have a really cool spot over here that is just fine to work as a staging point for an invasion or whatever kind of means I, I want. It's the best way to expand into your expansion victory because you get chunks of provinces every time you do it. So provinces count when they belong to your cities directly or when they belong to your free cities with at least a bonded vassalage. So if you get to those points too, you don't even need to integrate them if you don't want. Um, either way, it just gets you a ton of, uh, yeah, so this guy contributes to my total amount of uh, uh, provinces. But uh, working vassals is really crucial in this game because you do have to worry about that city cap, remember? So if you're not investing in your city cap, then just simply getting the vassals still nets you a good amount of income the magic materials, you get plenty of units from Rally of the Lieges, which is going to populate right here. They're the only ones that have actually populated for this character. And it also gives you the ability to integrate into them if you so wish. So definitely focus on vassals and spreading those Whispering Stones as much as you can. There is a, um, in the uh, Empire development, there is a Court of the Whispers and Shadow, which allows you to give Whispering Stones to other Empire's vassals to gain tribute with them, which is something you normally can't do, which is pretty cool. So through both of your beginner scenarios, either the story or the actual beginner scenario, the game doesn't really illustrate how important claims are. When you jump into your first realm to actually play outside of those scenarios, you're going to find that you're overwhelmed with both grievances and claims and how you have to deal with them. Claims are pretty important here because they allow you to create a net around your opponent to box them in, or 
it's a great way for you to kind of extend your reach to a location you intend on expanding to. So when we take a look at my empire, my budding little empire here in one of those other saves, um, you can see my border, which is called my domain, right? This orange hard outline. Now I'm going to zoom in here and you can see my province uh, grid is turned on and you can do that by going to in escape into settings into interface and then borders here at the bottom. I have it set to all um, for the uh, intents of this video, but it also could be nice for you as you kind of learn where things are in relation to you. So you have an immediate claim on anything directly outside of your borders. This includes both outposts like this guy right here and your cities and a claim is important because they appear on provinces adjacent to a city domain outpost and explored ancient wonders. So if another ruler builds on this, it creates a grievance, which you would then use to go to war. And it's important because you build up too many of these grievances, they can go to war on you without you having the ability to go to war on them. And going into an unjust war, which we'll talk about in the diplomacy section next, has a lot of really negative ramifications. So outside of this claim, there is a distant claim. And distant claims, as it says here, uh, yield less of your penalties and are only violated by building an outpost or exploring an ancient wonder. So this is my domain, right? This big old glowy line. Well, this is my claim on this location. And then three provinces out, I have a distant claim. So it says claim on this province, Vlad Dracula. Distant claim. Well, distant claim. Yeah, I'll, I'll go this direction to kind of keep it one, or one, two, three, now I go over here and we don't have a claim, right? Because now we are one, two, three, and then our domain. So if you basically get claims three provinces away from your domain, and that enables you to create grievances or net in your opponent, like I said. So for example here, our opponent has created this outpost right here, which gives them distant claim one, two, three. That's right on my damn border. As you can see, we both have a distant claim here. So if I go to expand to this, then I'm already going to start creating grievances. And it puts a lot of pressure on me because it enables them to have, to have the ability to go to war with me much faster. And in the, this is normal difficulty. The game expands here very quickly. I can see that his, here is his, um, his crown city, his throne city. <laughs> I don't know why I keep messing that up. Right here, the Primo Nebula. So he's already up my ass and it's the beginning of the game. So really work on making outposts because outposts give you these distant claims. This enables him to say, okay, he's got a distant claim over here and this is a location that I hope to integrate into my faction. They're already into a pact of loyalty. They're almost vassals with me. So it puts a lot of pressure on you to get outposts out as well. And if you're playing a barbarian, barbarians have the ability to make outposts with their scouts. So you can scout in directions, find things, and it does cost you double, but it's a nice way to kind of give you some expansion points. You can also see another opponent over here has placed an outpost right in this location, which, well, again, is going to start giving them distant claims around here. So it really puts a lot of pressure on you, and it's really important to know how these claims affect how the game is played because the diplomacy section next is really all going to be based off of the grievances created from all of these claims and a bunch of other things. So let's pivot now into that. So all these claims come together into our diplomacy. And diplomacy is pretty important. And uh, you could pretty much ignore this, the mechanic too and just declare war on everyone if you so wish. But let me just kind of break this down. So we'll look at this one guy here who we just don't really have much of a relationship with. Um, you can negotiate with them and you can trade any number of my own assets. So stuff like uh, contact information. So I can I can basically introduce them to another ruler. Any of my resources, my magic materials, my items, my cities, or just send those things as a gift. And then I can request any of their assets or their items, whatever it is. Um, also, you have these treaties here you can do, like Open Borders, Teleporter Pact, Province Claiming Pact. Now, more treaties do uh, unlock as you get different, um, I guess I, I guess this is a treaty. I don't know if I call this a treaty or not, but 
If I do a wizard's bond with him, which means that the throne city of each ruler is revealed and rulers can call each other to war, this leads to a defensive pact. Also, it leads to these other treaties, open borders, province claiming pact, and teleporter pact. So province claiming pact is huge here because this allows me to claim provinces that this individual has a distant claim on without causing any uh, casualties as it causes, as it says here. And this is basically, um, they're talking about more grievances than anything else. An open borders too is the ability to move in and out of their domain without causing any issues and specifically the domain, right? This, this big old outline of mine. And this, this moves into a defensive pact, which allows you to basically say, Hey, they'll answer a call to war. Should you get attacked? Um, if, if, if you're the defender, right? If you're an aggressor, that's different. Also, that will lead to an alliance where, you know, you're just put together with each other and enabled players are automatically called for aid in wars. So you, you get an option in a defensive pact. In an alliance, it's just a, an automatic uh, push in. I think, no, no one in this, at this save point has a uh, defensive pact right now. No, they don't. But uh, outside of that, You've got your negotiations, you've got your pronouncements where you can declare friendship, which is basically, uh, we've already done it here. Uh, we pay a gold upkeep and we move towards increasing our relations with them. So uh, a modifier that slowly increases towards 300 positive um, relation with them. We'll add to the ruler. Any grievance gained against the ruler that will be reduced by 40% as well. And when two rulers declare friendship with each other, each active diplomatic treaty, they have increased the maximum relation bonus by a plus 25 up to 400. So this does cause a 10 gold upkeep though, like I was saying. Uh, you can declare a rivalry, which is the exact opposite. So if you do a grievance, it's increased by 40% rather than decreased like you would for a declaration of friendship. You can fabricate a, a grievance, which helps with basically uh, creating a... Uh, cast a spelly, right? A uh, uh, cast a spelly, a, a, a war um, justification, which you pay money and you get a grievance on them. And this allows you to, um, uh, again, push forward a war. But note here, trying to denounce an opposing ruler using a fabricated grievance will cause them to have a grievance against you. So no, note those things. Because lastly, you do have denounce. A denouncement is a verbal warning about a grievance that affects the targeted ruler and their relation with other AI rulers that you both have met. Um, so denouncing a ruler using a fabricated grievance will cause them to have a grievance against you. But basically it's saying like, hey, they did something wrong and you can denounce it. And it helps to further reduce their relationship with other AI, whereas otherwise it would just be something that affects you two. So for example, if Blint the Underdelver here, the mole man of moles, goes and takes one of my provinces, that creates a grievance for me. And I can denounce that action. And otherwise, that would just be a penalty for me. If I denounce him, then other people will look down on that if they already have a negative um, relation with him and so on and so forth. So this basically helps you to throw that person in the mud if you so wish. So we're going to move over here to Acre on the Endless. And Acre on the Endless, him and I have just been going back and forth with grievances towards one another. So pissing me off and I want to declare war on him. So I'm going to go ahead and press this button. Now, this says declare war without justification. I'm going to go into this, but I want to show you what happens if you do that. If you do an unjust war, grievances awarded to non-allied rulers is 20. Grievances awarded to non-allied good alignment rulers is 40. So people are going to get pissed at you. Relations with vassal cities is reduced by 50 relations for 20 turns. Allegiance of vassal cities is reduced by 15. And relations with non-vassal cities is reduced by 50 for 20 turns. You lose 25 alignment and base global income of your Imperium is reduced by 40%. I do not recommend this ever. <laughs> I, I don't really know an instance in which this is a good idea. Maybe maybe I will once I play the game uh, even more, but in, in the 50, 60 hours I've played, I haven't found a time where I'm going, yeah, Unjust War makes sense, so don't do it. So we're going to abort that. And you can see here, if I hover over this, it gives me the justification positive and negative. I can see why certain things are uh, uh, gonna, are, certain modifiers are increasing my grievances, and I can see exactly what's gonna happen. But you know what? I really wanna go to war with this guy. I really wanna throw fisticuffs. So we have settle grievances. So anytime I do a grievance, it is in this location. I get really confused by the nomenclature here of their grievances. These are the grievances that they have on me for my actions. The Vlad ignored claims on uh, provinces. 
So that's a 35 grievance. Now you take whatever that number is and times it by 10, and that's the amount of gold it takes to settle that grievance. So if I give this guy 250 gold, I settle this grievance, he no longer has it, and it reduces this number right here by 25. Now over on this side, we have your grievances, which are grievances I have on things this ruler has done to me. Right, so the opposite. Again, I think the nomenclature of that confuses the crap out of me. And I, my brain's small, so maybe that's why. So I can do the opposite here. You know what? I don't want to pay 250. I just need 14. I just need four, um, four less grievance points. Is that what I call those things? <laughs> um, four less grievance to make this a just war. So you know what? Akron the Endless insulted my empire. Whatever, man. I'll let that slide. So. Let's do 40 here and I can forgive this transgression. Or I can straight up sell it. The grievance and its effects of your relations will be removed for the given price. Um, or forgive. So this gives me some alignment. So you get some options here. But I'm going to go ahead and go with this one because it allows me to pay for the transgression um, to be removed. Uh, this one, he has to pay me. I'm selling it to him, right? So I'm going to pay this 250. And now we have a minor justification for our war. And we can go to war with him. So declare just justified war. And I can see here the relation with the allied rulers minus 50 for 20 turns and alignment is minus 10 because it's a minor justification. If I were to somehow get this even further, like if I was able to do that one, um, I would be able to get more. I, I wouldn't have all these alignment hits. But we're going to justify war here. We still deal with that clear this button and we're now immediately at war now we can negotiate a truce from here if we wish but note this that any anyone that has a defensive pact with this ruler is going to join in with that ruler and against me so just before you jump into it make sure you look over here at your uh the little placards that give information on your characters because that's what we're going to go through next because this shows us your threat level, you know, the ruler feels confident towards your empire, which affects your relations with them by 50. We found out the following contributing factors. They are fighting too many wars. They are in need of an ally. You are supported by wizard bonds. Your army poses a threat to them. So they are at ease, meaning that they're not going to be throwing fisticuffs with me. I think this actually shows me the different levels. No. Threat level versus how threatened are the rulers feel. This level is influenced by many factors that look at how each ruler is doing. So... It shows me, too, what they're interested in. They need Arcanium Ore, Haste Berries, and Fire Forge sto uh, Stone, as well as money. His personality is a strategic strategist warlord, an ambitious ruler who values strategy and magical powers. So think of this kind of like a um, an AI personality, an AI persona for this character. And it shows you what he likes. He likes empires that have summoned units and that have defeated other empires, but he dislikes empires that trade grievances and empires with stronger research. So if I do those things, it's going to affect my relationship with him. Also informs the behavior on the strategy map. This is the kind of things they're, they're going towards. They always try to exterminate. They're never going to surrender. They're driven by war. And makes sense, right? He's jumped into a lot of wars. Also, we get Throne City. It's not been discovered yet, so it won't show on the map for me. And the race is Void Seekers. Um, also, it shows me his alignment, as you can see right there. Now, remember what I said, too, about how um, factions expand out way fast and way hard? Well, here's an outpost. Here's a city that he that was an outpost. Here is another outpost. And his, his throne city is somewhere up here. So that gives you a sense for how hard and how aggressive they push out in the game. But back over here to Diplomacy, um, I also get his affinity, and sometimes that can be at odds with mine, so it's just kind of worth noting that. Um, but if I look at some of the other people, I can see that this guy is a competitive merchant, and his threat level is confident. Uh, or this person is indifferent, and they have authoritarian diplomat. So they like empires with a single race, and empires with a strong military, but they dislike ones with good relations with free cities, and empires that have many alliances. So just keep these things in mind. You know, If someone's on your doorstep, you're probably wondering, well, what kind of, a, what kind of profile do they have? Take a look at it. You don't need to discover their throne city or anything like that to find that stuff out. And it's a good idea of an indicator of how belligerent someone is on your border. Also, too, is this final little note on your diplomacy is this right here. So this gives you the rank of your character against all the other characters on the map. So my overall ranking is only six because it's an average, right? So my economy is pretty good, but my military expansion and my magic ranking are all crap. 
Meshra the Radiant is rank 1 because she is a beast on expansion and military. Pretty damn good with rank uh, magic and also has an awesome economy. So you want to make sure you're pushing up that ranking for whatever your victory condition is because it's really going to help, help you out in maximizing your efforts towards that victory condition. And it'll also help you out with anything you're trying to do with certain people. Like if you have a lot of military, some people are going to shirk away from you. Or if you have a huge economy, they're going to want to trade with you. So just make sure you're pushing those things up and make sure you're looking at all these little factoids with alliance defensive peace and war for uh, uh, what every single uh, faction is doing on the map the last subject i want to hit on is sieging and combat so taking a look at the city of oraculum or oraculum whatever it is it has 20 here we go 20 fortification health and fortification health is basically how long a city holds out in the event of a siege. And you would deal damage to this fortification using fortification damage. You have an initial base value of 10. So if you did no modifier to it, you're reducing the fortification health by 10 every turn. As you can see, base value of 10. So siege projects, which we'll show off in just a second here, are going to help you reduce that number quickly. And also besieging units with siege breaker increase that damage by 1 every turn. It's just like producing something, right? You're trying to get towards that total number to knock down the walls. Uh -huh. So let's go ahead and attack here. And it'll say start the siege. So it's going to take 2 turns, the 20 uh, fortification here. In order to attack a city, you must first be seated to breach its defenses. And once you do that, we now have siege projects we can put in. So we must first breach the wall before our armies can move and attack the city. So these siege projects will cost us money. You'll get more siege projects with tomes, with all sorts of stuff. So that's what unlocks these. But these are your base four that come with every single person who goes and attacks the city. You can do undermining the walls. So that are um, to, just to kind of put that 10 in perspective, here it is. There's our 10 fort damage. This happens every turn, right? So if I put undermining the walls, additional wall breaches appear at the start of the combat. Well, we can add that in, or I do a headlong assault, which is a super high increase, but units besieged in the city take 20 physical damage at the start of the combat, and it costs no gold. So it's a real quick way to kind of push things in. You can harass defenders, which reduces the defending city's damage the opposite of headlong assault, right? So this hurts me, that hurts the defenders. Um, and I got to construct onishers. Now, of course, there are a bunch of different things that you can do here. You can, um, there's what destroys towers and all sorts of things. But the onishers one is nice. At the start of the battle, gain two onishers on the attacker side until the end of battle. They're immobile siege craft units, meaning they auto do what they want to do. With long range area effect attacks that are great for destroying obstacles but are inaccurate against units, only one type of siege craft can be brought into combat. If multiple siege products would be bring in, only the strongest of them will appear. So. Um, you're only allowed two siege projects unless you get tomes or empire developments that increase the amount of siege projects. So let's just go ahead and click like undermining walls and we'll do construct onagers. And then I would just simply press close. And you only can do this at the beginning. Once you press close and go to the next turn, that's it. You can't do anything different. But I can compare my army of 703 to their army of 352. I believe it doesn't actually include this army too here though oh no it does it does it does. we'll go ahead and end this turn i'll just kind of push us through to get to the actual siege going all the way in and anyone who comes in my reinforcement range will actually jump in on this fight so they had someone jump in on their reinforcement range so they got a bunch of reinforcements but i'm going to go into obviously i'm not going to win this right but i'm just going to go into manual combat to show off some other stuff on the actual siege map before we jump into a, just a normal combat here um but this looks like we actually got attacked before the siege could go off so it's kind of like a sally out everyone that's in the siege will actually attack me in addition to everyone outside so in the event of an actual siege, you would just see fortifications that you cannot, um, that are like impassable terrain, unless you have someone who has siege breaker that can actually destroy those fortifications. The same thing that an onager would do. You simply would attack it like a normal unit. It breaks apart and it becomes passable terrain. But those are sieges. I wanted to kind of quickly show off siege projects because they're pretty crucial to understand as trying to break the walls down quickly. But let's jump into a normal uh, combat now. So jumping into combat, we see the enemy we're about to attack and their relative strength 
and mine to train. Remember, we talked about this in the army section, but again, just worth talking about so that you know before you jump into combat what you are up against. And if I hover over them, we can see that red outline I talked about that gives us a reinforcement range. So no one's going to be reinforcing them, and no one's going to be reinforcing me. And I get a good an idea, good idea of how that battle's going to play itself out. It's a pretty safe battle pretty much going to crush them. So we're going to right click here and I can actually attack them, let them leave, all sorts of stuff. We'll kind of, it's kind of like Heroes of Might and Magic where if you vastly outstrength them, then they say like, oh, well, let us leave. We're not going to fight you. But I got to make a video here, buddy. So sorry, we're going to attack. So I see there are whole units and everything like that. And this is where you can really get a lot of information, right? I remember, like I said, make sure you check out these, um, these unit cards to know what you're getting yourself into. Um, you can allow the AI to use spells in auto combat, because remember, anytime you cast a spell in combat, it does use combat map casting points, but it also uses your mana pool. And if you look at this fight, we really probably don't need it. So let's just go ahead and shut that off for the um, intents of this video. And we're gonna press auto combat. So all those kind of hidden values will roll and we'll see what the results are. And if we don't like the results, we just go ahead and press retry and go into the actual battle. Now, I find combat to be super self-explanatory, so I'm really not going to go too crazy into this section. Um, I think that you probably have this already pegged down, but I'll still kind of help you out a little bit with some things here and there, just to kind of give you some context. Um, you can press Control g to turn on your grid to help you kind of uh, navigate around the map. But the first turn, you cannot cast any spells. And every single UI uh, tip is kind of pretty much all there for you, right? You can see what their unit tier is, any kind of bonuses that they might have or you might have. You kind of have to usually click on them and get a little hover over. It's kind of a little tricky to get it, to actually see what's going on. But you can also conversely see it by looking right here. You can see our enemy too, what they've got, all that kind of fun action. So one of the biggest things I do want to point out is how these action points work, which are these three little blips. So if I move, it shows me, you know, okay, I'm going to spend two action points going all the way to this point. But you also see that I've got these abilities down here. So this tells me that it's going to use one action point to cast Healing Sap. But it's either that or move. So just keep those things in mind that these abilities, you kind of think of it as you can move and attack or use an ability or use an ability, period. Like that's it. You, you use the ability and you're done. Unless the ability is something like this that has no little blips. It doesn't cost you anything. Target enemy units become condemned until the end of battle. I can't really do that from here, but I wanted to show that off, but I guess I can't do it. Okay, so this is, this is a good, oh, damn it. Uh, but either way, using this, I'd still be able to do whatever I want if I so wish. So it's worth noting. But you also have these little crescents. So what happens in that case is I go to use this ability, Melee Strike. Well, it'll use any remaining action points automatically. So if I want to say, you know, do two two uh, melee strikes to one unit, then another melee strike to another. It's not how that works. When you right click with melee strike, it'll use any and all available action points until the thing is dead or you run out. And if you die, if it dies midway through your action, that counts as your action. You don't pivot to get to use another thing unless you have an ability that grants you an action point for killing something, which you'll get from a lot of different sources. So just kind of keep those things in mind. You have the ability just to kind of rotate your character. It doesn't cost you anything, but it helps reduce flanking. So if you know, hey, you know what? I'm facing this way, but I see they got a cavalry unit that's probably going to come this direction. I'll do that. And that just kind of changes my orientation so I do not get flanked. Um, that's important to know. So some things also to have uh, special defense mode. And defense mode is going to give you special things. Like in this case, it's a shield wall. So it extends its zone of control to all adjacent hexes, so all around it. And it gives them defense and resistance as well as immune to flanking. Remember, we talked about that because flanking does an additional 25% damage. And units in defense mode cannot be flanked, which is nice. And all adjacent friendly units gain three defense. So... I get two defense and resistance and everyone else gets three defense. It's pretty nice. Support units typically have warding like this, which is the same thing, but now all adjacent units gain three resistance and three status resistance, uh, which is nice when it comes to afflicting a status on something. And uh, you also have your ranged units, which will shoot at whatever prescribed range they've got. So this is five range. So if I look at this, if I hover over this unit, just kind of keeping my cursor here, it shows me that white dotted line of where that where their max range is. So 
So one, two, three, four, five, right? Because that's where it went. So that part right there. And you see that with that little icon right there. It tells me that's going to be five. That's a 90% is pretty much um, guaranteed to pretty much hit it at that five point. Also does me how much damage it does that's true of any type of thing, but affected by line of sight rules too. So line of sight means that if anyone's directly in front of the target, I'll actually reduce the hit points and they become obscured, which reduces it by 40%. So let's assume then that I wanted to shoot at this unit of zealots right here. Even though it's within my minimum range, I would be able to do my max point, my max percentage of actually being able to hit, but because my units are in the way, it would cause them to be obscured, reducing that to about 40%, 50%, 60%, whatever percentage I would have had raw without that uh, obstruction. Also cannot be used within enemy zone of control and physical ranged base. So you see that all these things are gonna give you an idea of how much damage it does. It's worth noting too that this says melee strike. It's gonna do nine and nine, so 18 damage, but it's gonna do 18 damage per action point. So you would multiply that number by three to get its actual full damage potential if you were to hit things uh, dead on. And some things too will give you stuff like this, a demolisher, so it damages fortified obstacles like we were talked about before. When you do a siege, this would blow up an obstacle for you. Or center defense, base 60% chance, chance of inflicting sunder defense or moving defense and status resistance. We talked about status resistance, right? That's the ability to resist a status effect. It's a flat penalty against a status effect landing on them. So it's quite nice. And the big thing too on the combat map is you have hit points and temp hit points. And temp hit points will look like, uh, so right now this is representative of their health. Um, as this drains, that's obviously again representative of their health. If I had temp hit points, it would restore this little blip here as a uh, striped line showing you that it's a temporary hit point meaning that once the battle ends, the temporary hit points are gone. You have to regenerate your hit points on the actual battle map. Other things too here, you have your morale, you have your hit points, and you have your uh, defense and resistances, all that kind of fun action is all right in this section. Um, you too also can, if like you're like, you know what, this beginning, this beginning stage, let's go ahead and auto combat. Let's let the, the, the game's UI actually take care of it, or AI. Okay, and we'll shut it off now because it's the independents are moving. We got the first turn out of the way, we're good to go. And we have some stuff over here like the combat history. You can retreat, or you can just restart the combat if you're like, you know what, I, I screwed up already to this point, let me reset. So now our spells are unlocked because it's turn two. And what I want to show off is how some of these spells, I don't think I have a mass, but I do, perfect. So. This says target enemy unit. Just simply targets a unit, no big deal. Target enemy unit sustains 15 spirit damage, becomes condemned until the end of the battle. Or you have this one, hold the line. Friendly units in a one hex radius. You might think that that's kind of a small radius, but it's not, you can see. It's a one hex radius around my cursor. That's the way you should frame it. So if you see one that says two hex radius, it's huge. So it's one hex here for my cursor, then another, then two hexes to left, right, up, down, center, whatever the hell. So those hex radii are pretty important ones to look at because in the early game, it gives you a lot of really good uh, damage buffs and bonuses. Then you have, of course, your damage, your, d your buff spells, whatever it is. So hold the line, this is gonna buff everything right here. So I've gone ahead and done that. I can only cast one spell a turn unless my character has an ability that would allow me to channel more energy and do um, more actions. It'll say like, oh, this allows you to cast more spells. And of course, remember, it pulls from our combat casting pool in the upper right-hand corner up here. Um, so once we kind of move through this, we can see all of our status effects that are currently active. This one is so tricky to actually get going. But there we go. Come on. There we go. There we go. There we go. There we go. Steadfast. It's like sometimes you can get this to actually appear. It's harder on the enemy. Yeah, there, there's a way to actually look at what these little symbols are. And yeah, it's being a, it's being a pain in the ace. Uh, but remember, like we said, this has zero, right? So target enemy becomes condemned. Zero action points. We cast this. Boom. And now we can still do all of our actions. So what I want to say here, too, is how that like the little attack of opportunity works. Once we come into base contact with them, um, we are locked in. We're pinned, right? And that means that we cannot move out of this little range, this, those little swords, unless we want to take... Um, 
opportunity attacks. So that's important. When you attack something, they also get a retaliation attack. So if I click on this character, we can see that he does 12 plus 2, which is 14 total damage. A retaliation attack is not at full strength. You take a look right there. It's doing 7 damage and only... Uh, 7 both physical and it looks like it... I think that means it's going to do physical and spirit, but it's not going to do like a set amount of spirit damage. Usually it would be a different amount see, because it's, it's 12 and two for 14, so it's seven. So retaliation attacks are half of your normal damage, important to know. Also, my entwined protectors have a chance to do 60 base chance of inflicting poison for three turns. So this thing, it shows here that, my, that it's got a 76% chance to apply poisoned. Well, we just condemned them, and condemned them reduces their status resistance by three. I hover over that, reduces this to so that it will often be affected by negative effects. I think it should give you an actual percent. There you go. I was like, where's the percentage breakdown? So that current modifier is minus 27%. And condemned is important for zeal because uh, you do more damage against things that are, have zeal. This damage is doubled against zeal, uh, uh, condemned units. So whenever you hover over and you see those little, oh, I can't, oh, it won't stay there. But you see 76% dash poisoned. It's just important to see those things because it shows you the modified amount after their innate status defense or penalties that they've got. So my base chance gets that modification there to be a little bit stronger here. So you just want to, again, just, just focus on this so that you, you don't waste any opportunities. You don't want to look at that and go, hey, you know what? How do I add on... Um, uh, or, or I, I want to go get this thing poisoned. Oh, it had a huge amount of um, resistance to status, so it didn't work. And it's important to also take consider that that said minus 27%, that's not a flat increase to yours. It is a 27% increase or decrease to your base chance. So 27% more of 60% is 76%. Just keep all these little things in mind because they're important. And I know that sounds super overwhelming, but I promise I don't ever think about that stuff when I play. I just go, okay, 76% chance, go ahead and attack. I, I just want to explain where those things come from so you understand. So, so that it, it makes sense to you as you're not just jumping into this thing going, well, where the, where the hell did that number come from? Um, two, also, we have the support's ability to buff things. So let's go ahead and do this. This is going to give us bolstered defense and resistance, which increases our defense and resistance. And this is going to help with morale and hit points. Um, also, like I said, the bannermen, different, uh, the support units and magic casting units, different than range units. Take a look at this. This range unit is going to attack three times. This guy, who's only going to attack once and his turn ends. So support and magic casting units you're really using their other ability not their their ranged attack ability it's just there to, to use if you don't have anything to do so let's just go ahead and cast this ability here there we go it goes down and then lastly we'll just do these knights to show off how charge works because charge gains 20 percent damage per hex traveled up to three hexes so it's going to do 60 percent more damage in this case cancels defense mode and removes retaliation attack so that little icon right there that denoted that they had a retaliation and that's what i was trying to show off they no longer have a retaliation attack regardless of whether or not i attacked with charge so i went up here it would show me it would say retaliation attack here so see, this would does not have retaliate on there anymore because you get only one retaliate per turn unless you have something that buffs that up. So we'll just do this to show it off and it reflects obviously how much damage is being done and it cancels that defense mode. It just does a ton of damage. And we're gonna move over here to show off range combat real quick. So regardless of where we go, we only get one action. You just definitely wanna go for like the higher percentage if you're only gonna get one action. Just also keep in mind, Dealing with some units that have pass through or stuff like that. Again, not to be confused with pass over, which is a holiday. Um, that will result in them just moving through your units and attacking your range units. The AI will prioritize them. But you just get the ability to attack with range right there. So I think we've pretty much covered everything here. The only thing I do want to highlight is, uh, yeah, just defense mode, sure, whatever happens, happens, is your spell book and how favorites work. Because you see those three I those three spell icons over there uh, above my, my character's face. Well, you can manipulate those. We'll go ahead and go to the spell book. These little buttons here, they basically put them on that bar. See? We take them all. Stop it. 
You take them all off, and there we go. You're only allowed three favorites at any one time, but it's just kind of worth noting um, because those things are nice to just kind of have. Oh, I press the wrong button. Uh, those things are just kind of nice to have right there if you want to use them. Um, they're just on the fly. So that is pretty much how combat works. It's super self-explanatory in and of itself, um, but I just wanted to kind of break that down so that you have an idea of how to address any and all things that happen to you in combat. The last thing to talk about with combat is once you get a victory point, uh, or once you get a victory, if anything was defending a node, you have to move on to that node. I believe I've said this before in combat, but just to our uh, uh, army movement, but I just want to illustrate it here. If you don't move on to the node, you don't capture the resource, you don't capture whatever it is. There might be stuff in here that's going to give you something. You might have run out of uh, movement points to get to this point. So in the next turn, you want to make sure you move here. It's crucial. So let's see. Okay, we moved and we got 119 gold for doing so. Moving on to mana would oftentimes give you mana, so on and so forth. But just make sure you move on to those nodes if you win a battle. So at that, it brings our video here to a close. And I hope this helps you out in really cracking into Age of Wonders 4. I don't think the game is too complex as far as comparing it to, say, Crusader Kings 3, which is immense and i might make a video on its own for claims just so that people really understand them i think the biggest thing to focus on in this video is really claims and diplomacy it's the thing that you probably don't understand and you have no idea how important it is outside of the tutorial portions of the game so if you have any questions or you're struggling with anything about the game by all means just go ahead and let me know in the comment section below more than happy to explain any mechanic as best i can i know this is a pretty long video but i wanted to hit all the basics also as best i could and lastly, if you want, you can swing on over to my Twitch linked in the description and pinned comment. Uh, you can find me playing this game on my Twitch as well as the new Crusader Kings 3 DLC coming out and ask any questions that you might have, anything like that. Always happy to help out my bros. But as always, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.